welcome. This is Renata Moreira of Our Family Coalition. Today's host for um, Our Family Coalition's Alphabet Soup, Nourishing LGBTQ Families One Conversation at a Time. Well, in today's episode, we're going to, to talk about racial justice. Very, very current topic. As you all know, we are in the middle of a new civil rights movement here in the United States. Violence against people of color, and more specifically, black men and women in this country has been wildly exposed all over the media. And as a family organization, we are constantly considering how our families are situated within this racist system. As LGBT parents that are differently situated and also differently impacted by the system, we have been having endless conversations with our children, with our neighbors, and with other parents about how to talk about justice. As you've all seen, the brilliant organizing of Black Lives Matter has taken this hashtag off of social media and into the streets, bringing attention to this brutality. And so today, I'm really, really thrilled that we're going to speak to a mother, a mother of four daughters who's a brilliant contributor to our family coalition, our co-chair of our board, who's also a city administrator for the city of Oakland, who's co-founder of Oakland Pride, and also um, is a, the co-chair of the board, and is a secretary for East Bay Stonewall. I'm so thrilled you're here. Amber Todd, thanks so much for being here Thank with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. Um, so I started with you being a queer mama. And I want to zoom into that because it's a part of you that I know you're very proud of. And so talk to us a little bit about raising four daughters and specifically during these political times. So it's, it's definitely interesting when you think about the intersection of how many things we're juggling. So not only am I raising women, and I have to raise them to be strong women, but I'm also raising women of color that have multiple ethnic backgrounds. And I'm also raising women as a two-mother household. So as a queer mother, I, I have to teach my kids basically all sides of the spectrum. They can't just be one-sided. They have to understand the different things that they're walking out into the world and the things that people may say and to be able to not necessarily fight it, but be able to speak from a place of, of understanding and knowledge. Mm. Yeah, that, that's profound because I, I would think that as a parent, not only you want them to speak from a place of knowledge, you also have a lot of heart on the line, right? You oh, have definitely. all these fears that might come up, all these things that might come up. So um, how do you help them ma navigate those fears and maybe your own fears as mm -hmm. a parent um, having those conversations? Well, absolutely. There was a, a time when my wife and I looked at what my daughters are being taught, and they go to a really, a really great school. Um, but I noticed that there was a deficiency in what they were being taught about their African-American heritage. And so I went to the library and I said, okay, you know, once a month we go to the library and we pick new books. And I said, okay, every other month we have to pick a book about, you know, an African-American person, a leader, a dancer, or something, whatever you're interested in. But it has to be about this culture because you're not learning it. And my daughter brought home a slavery book and she had nightmares that night after reading just the first chapter. Mm. And she said, mommy, mommy, I don't want to go back to slavery. I don't want people to whip me and to beat me. And what that brought up to my attention was the fact that there is still things that we can't quite protect our children against. Mm -hmm. But the reality, we can't, we, can't, we can't shade them from the reality. And so as much as we'd love to protect them, it's in the media, it's all over social media. My daughters have Instagram and Facebook, so they're seeing it in real time. And so if I, I always tell my friends, you better be the first one teaching your children what's going on because if the world teaches them, it's gonna be a cruel story. Mm -hmm. So the most important thing for me is to be honest with them and have those honest conversations because they're gonna see it and they're gonna hear it. And there's not much you can do to, to stop it other than have them live in a bubble. Mm, that, that is profound, uh, Amber, uh, speaking as a mother, as an activist, and as an organizer, uh, the importance of knowledge and the importance of also empowerment to all our children, regardless of their racial and ethnic background, um, mm -hmm. as we navigate this world. Um, you know, as a family organization, sometimes we get heat. Um, 
from folks that think that uh, involving kids and, and children in social movements or even having them organize or advocate for their families or for change, uh, that's putting them at risk. What, do you, what would you say to those folks? Well, there, there's, there's a couple things that I would say to those. One is that we're at risk no matter what we do. We're always at risk. When we step outside in the morning, we're at risk of something. And so just sitting on the sidelines and being silent, my daughters are taught that being silent and watching something happening that's, that's not right or that's improper or bullying or anything, that makes you no better than the people that are perpetrating it. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't also mean that you have to have your kids at the front lines of a protest. There are other ways. My daughter just wrote a paper about using privilege to move the pendulum of change. And that's exactly what you do. My daughters have voices. We all have voices. And we all have platforms to utilize those voices. Mm -hmm. And so it's teaching them how to use their voices in an effective manner, but definitely not sitting sitting back on the sidelines and saying we should do nothing because for fear of what our children would be put through, they're being put through stuff regardless. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, you know, in terms of using the platforms, uh, we see, for example, Patrice Colors and Alicia Garza, the two queer women of color, two fierce black women or co-founders of the Black Lives Matter, right? They are at the front lines. Uh, and we still we're seeing a, a, a lot of uh, coverage around black leadership within the movement, right? Mm -hmm. Broader movement for equity. Um, and so oftentimes the uh, violence against trans women and women specifically mm -hmm. still gets uh, put on the sidelines. So. Mm -hmm. What do you think that's about and how can we use our platform and, and whatever type of privilege we have to uh, increase the level of diversity that we see within those uh, movements? Well, I think it's forums like this and it's conversations and it starts with conversations from from just a, a conversation with your family at the at the dinner table, um, conversations with your coworkers, conversations in general. You start there. And, and it's important to note that just because we're highlighting one portion of the movement, which is Black Lives Matter, and we're and we're looking at the the struggle of or the atrocities that are happening to young African American men, it doesn't negate what's going on, but it's a starting point. And a lot of times it's this divisiveness that it says, well, they're not, they're not talking about what's important to me, but it's all important to all of us. And so if we start from that starting point and we use our platforms, shows like this, being able to discuss this openly as both queer women and being able to say that, yes, there's violence happening against black males. It's, it's an atrocity and it's disproportionate. Mm -hmm. um, there's also using that time to highlight that there's also atrocities happening to trans women to trans men, to African-American women and brown and Latino women. Yeah. So using those to, to move the, the pendulum of change. I mean, my daughter said it the best, use our privilege. Um, yeah, and you know, it brings us to a final uh, question in terms of white privilege, uh, right? Uh, we are talking often with our white allies and really kind of trying to help unpack what that means to have your white privilege. And, and what would you tell our, our uh, as an immigrant Latina, right, I have a lot to say to our white allies, <laughs> uh, and especially within the queer community, I think there's a lot of work we need to do. What would you tell our, uh, ask our white allies that are building in parents towards racial justice? I would say speak up. I, I would absolutely say speak up. This is not just a problem that's impacting one race or another. It impacts our entire country. It impacts every family and everywhere. And so if you don't stand up, as exactly how I teach my daughters, if you don't stand up when you see something wrong, then you're no better than the people that are perpetrating the wrongs. Sitting on the sidelines and being silent doesn't help anybody. And so being out there in the front lines, not making it a black and brown movement, but making it an American movement, making it a our movement, that means all of us. And being the face for that. A lot of times, uh, you know, uh, it was interesting. I had a diversity class the other day where I realized that I had white privilege. And it seems awkward mm -hmm. coming from somebody who's multiracial. But I have privileges because of my brighter skin tone than my wife does as a darker skin tone. And so being able to stand up when I see something wrong happening to her, mm. that's something. That's a start. And mm -hmm. so saying something, speaking up when you see something wrong, that's what we can all do to help. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much, Amber. This is, uh, this is powerful. It's about um, continuing this conversation and also moving this conversation into action as allies and for all of our families uh, so they're safe and, and their full liberation is achieved. Um, we have to take a short break, uh, but when we come back, I'll be joined by the brilliant educator and founder of Start Dialogue, Tara Fleming. Don't go away. Thanks for being with us, Amber. Thank you. I'm Heclina. I've been doing drag here in San Francisco for almost 20 years, and uh, over the past couple of months, I just opened up my club, Oasis. It's been going really well. People really seem to appreciate the space. It's something people say San Francisco really needs right now, because the city has been changing a lot. I always had this attitude of, of opening a space that was kind of like for everybody, and that's just kind of the attitude and the, the, uh, the ethics of Oasis, is it's kind of a space for everybody. How does it feel to be a business owner? I don't know, you know, it's funny because I still need, I still have to kind of pinch myself to believe it's actually true, you know what I mean? Like I walk in there and, and I go up to the bar and I go, oh, could I please have a glass of water? You know, it's kind of like, I forget that it's my place. Running gay clubs, it's changed a lot. Um, I think that gay people now, they're everywhere. They don't feel like they have to maybe be in a gay bar all the time, so you have to be much more creative about how you are enticing people to come out to your club. I, I guess I'm successful because I'll just say it, I work really hard at what I do. I also like to provide a really quality experience for people. So yes, you know, people will pay to see my shows and pay to come to my club, but I always like, like to give them something that's worth it. The experience that they'll, they'll leave my shows going, okay, that was worth it, you know what I mean? This has always been my attitude. Um, just to entertain people and so it seems like that works, you know. I would say to young kids, you know, just kind of form your own identity and, uh, and you know, don't let others dictate how you should behave or think. Uh, you can always go to uh, sfoasis.com to find out about all the entertainment and nightlife that we have going on at Oasis. If you want to see drag, we've got that for you. If you want to see some queer hip-hop parties or queer dance parties, we have that for you. Spotlight on success and achievement. Brought to you by Wells Fargo. Together we'll go far. Hello, welcome back. I'm your host, Renata Moreira of Our Family Coalition. Um, yes, I am very excited to welcome our next guest. Um, she has over 20 years of experience as, as an educator, facilitator, and really a leader on cultural responsiveness, anti-bias education, and issues of power and privilege. She's also my very good friend and the education director at Our Family Coalition, Tara Fleming. Tara, thank you so much for being here with us today. No, oh, it's absolutely my pleasure, Renata. Thank you for having me. So Tara, we're gonna just jump right in. You've been doing this work for a long time. Um, and I, I'm curious, where did it start? Where did it all start for you as a white cis ally? Well, it's an interesting story, and I love to tell stories, so I'm going to tell you a short one. That is, my grandmother was a racist, and she disowned my nephew when he was born because his father was a black American. I was 12 years old, and I realized how heinous racism could be in a family as it did break ours up. And so my first action was actually to call her by her first name, not grandma anymore, and it was a small action, but for a 12-year-old, I realized that every time I called her by her first name, she would remember that she was basically marginalizing and um, not accepting my nephew, which was really painful for our entire family. So it started very young, started very young, and I've stayed true to it because it captured my heart, and basically it's become my mission uh, ever since. Uh, and, and so, yeah, it has. I've seen you in action uh, doing workshops and uh, participating in a variety of uh, movements and, and solidarity movements as both an ally and also a leader. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the ally co uh, concept and where and when and how? Yes, ally. Ally is a big word. It's actually becoming a little bit of a buzzword. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about how that comes to be? Is it a noun? Is it a verb? Is it an identity? Is it 
uh, something you aspire to. Uh, for me, ally is a way to stand in solidarity. It's an understanding of privilege. And being a white, middle class, straight, cisgendered person with an education, able bodied, I mean, I was born with so much privilege. And understanding that was crucial to my abilities to be in community with. Uh, the different movements that were for um, social justice. So being an ally is a really important part of the work and it doesn't come right away. It's a journey, it's something that you commit to and it's constant self-learning. Uh, and I think uh, my biggest lesson from allyship is humility. Humility and an open mind to be educated around where I can't see what I don't know about myself and my past, my history, my people. Um, and that, for me, is the true liberation, is understanding how you fit into the bigger movement and how you can be part of the solution. And um, yeah, yeah, it's a big part of how I just live my life mm. um, every minute. Uh, absolutely. I mean, humility uh, uh, as part of key part of the solution. Uh, yeah, I want to zoom into this uh, solution piece. Uh, you also developed and co-directed co -directed the Youth Action Project, which is part of a much broader uh, initiative uh, called the White Privilege Conference. Yes. Can you talk to us about the White Privilege Conference and if there's anything coming up, maybe if yes. you want to plug in? Very exciting. Uh, I my heart is with the White. Privilege Conference. I have been a part of WPC now for 12 years. The conference itself has been in existence for 16 years and was founded by Dr. Eddie Moore Jr. in Pella, Iowa. And it started out as a, a dialogue around how to understand white privilege and more specifically how to dismantle white supremacy and other forms of oppression. We have uh, been very successful over the years. It goes state to state. It's uh, 2,000 people strong. And the Youth Action Project was developed by myself and a group of amazing educators and activists. And we workshop 200 high school students every year uh, to give them ideas on how to talk about white privilege, how to be part of social justice movements in their schools, and how they can go back to campus and articulate these concepts in a way that their families and, and their uh, teachers and mentors can understand. It's a very, very powerful conference. It is not your average diversity conference. It is a place where we come to do the work to understand how white privilege is affecting all of us, how it is harming us, and how it can be destroyed. And everybody comes, every walk of life, every color, every, everybody is welcome and comes together to have those conversations. Uh, anything coming up in the Bay, maybe? Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you for the plug. We are now planning the White Privilege Symposium, and that will be a small experience of the conference, and it will be on November 13th and 14th in Oakland and in San Francisco. And we are going to represent the Bay by doing it on both sides. And we will have a website and lots of information coming to you real soon. But save the date, November 13th and 14th. All right, for the White Privilege Conference Symposium by the Bay. Yes. Cool. Um, to wrap up, uh, you are also a mom. And you're a mom of a handsome 11-year-old. Thank you. Um, and can you share with us how you introduced Loyal, your uh, son, yes. into these conversations about racial justice? Yeah. And how do you talk to him about it so other mothers who might be listening in yeah. can also learn something from it? Yeah, this is a really important part of the work. I started... Uh, in early childhood development and worked in the uh, K-12 system for many, many years, very specifically helping and supporting teachers to talk about racial justice issues in the classroom. And I was um, surprised to see that when I had my own son that I was starting to avoid the topics and be afraid of the topics and not knowing how to say it. And I actually had all the resources and the ideas. So when I started to practice, it was very powerful. We talk about his identity. We talk about who his people are, his ancestry. We talk about differences. We talk about how to respect different kinds of people. And my son, at nine, was able to articulate uh, the constructs of transgender identity, of queer identity, different racial identities. He was able to acknowledge the differences. And most importantly, was able to see when people were being teased 
or being hurt or othered and was able to talk about it. And this is the crucial part. If you really want equity literacy in your children, you have to educate them and give them the tools and language to be able to see what is happening so that they too can be part of the solution. And that's where allyship comes in. That is uh, moving away from the bystander mentality into someone who stands up for what is right. And uh, it's a beautiful thing to see my child now just flourishing. Mm. That's uh, that's brilliant. <laughs> I'm getting moved uh, and inspired. Uh, so when I raise my own little mixed race babies, uh, <laughs> I, I introduce the conversation very early. Uh, right. Thank you so much, Tara, for sharing of yourself uh, yes. and your work with us today. That's it for the show. Uh, we'll wrap up with a two-minute segment um, called Food for Thought. Today we'll feature our brilliant uh, development associate, Alan. Um, well, take it away, Alan. Hi, uh, this is Alan. I'm the development associate at our family coalition. And I want to begin today's Food for Thought actually with a story. Um, a friend was sharing a story on her Instagram uh, about the hashtag, if I die in police custody, uh, where black folks share what we want said about us uh, and done if we were to die in police custody. In fact, uh, when her sister called her, uh, she asked why uh, my friend was talking about dying uh, when uh, my friend explained to her sister that she needed to share the video because of Sandra Bland's death um, and because of the police brutality uh, and murder of black folks around the nation. Um, her sister responded, uh, if it's inevitable, should I make one too? Uh, her sister is 11. Um, when I hear the statement um, my friend's sister made, it reminds me of the fierce urgency of now on uh, the plight of black folks in this nation. Sandra Bland's death, um, the brutality and death of our black sisters um, by police hands is becoming far too common. Um, every 28 hours, a black person is killed by the hands of our own police in our own communities. Uh, this cannot continue. We must confront white supremacy and systemic racism head on by radical policies and holding our apparent uh, progressive elected officials accountable. We must recognize the fierce urgency of now. Um, so we're calling all POC LGBTQ parents to get involved. We know being in the streets and protesting isn't always feasible for our families with children, uh, but our family coalition, we're creating alternatives. Attend the racial justice platform, the, the racial justice roundtable, uh, to create a more just world for all of our kids, and particularly kids of color, and to allies white allies, brown allies, API allies, even cisgendered black male allies like myself, um, raise your voice. Do not be silent. Because as one of our sisters put it, your silence is killing us. Silence is unacceptable. And say her name as we move forward. Say Sandra Bland. Say India Clark, say Tamir Rice. And for my black folks, remember, self-love and self-care is extremely important right now. Our bodies are not theirs. Our lives are not theirs to take. Say her name. Keep asking questions. And in the words of Toni Morrison, described in her book, Beloved, the dark liver, the dark, dark liver, love it love it and the beat beating heart love that too more than eyes or feet more than lungs that have the yet the, the the air to draw more than your life holding womb or your life giving parts hear me now love your heart for that is the prize black lives matter thank you mm -hmm.